Right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, dudes, uh, gamers, pick up artist dudes, because that's the uh, the audience that obviously these p- p- podcasts are mainly targeted at, although I'm perhaps an older dude than most out there. I have the pleasure of introducing to you this afternoon the sultry, uh, sticky, somewhat exhausting, really a hot summer's day in London actually. Yes. Um, but we're in our lovely air-conditioned surroundings in the Baltic. Anyway, I have the pleasure of introducing to you Alex McClelland. I'm not going to edit in some applause, but I could edit in some, some applause there, actually, but I could do. Inflate my ego. Well, I, 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 I will just tell you how I met Alex. I've, just had, I've, I've watched um, a presentation that he did quite recently in May, which I'm going to link below so you can watch it to get a, an idea of, of who this dude is. Um, but I met him through James Tusk, which James is actually one of the most popular hit podcast interviewees that I've had on the channel since uh, yeah, since I began. And uh, when I was talking to James about recommendations for other people who might be interested to talk to, and when I was sort of kind of getting curious in the kind of the inner game arena, the the inner stuff, um, he, re- he put forward Alex McClellan, whom I met a couple of months ago, and now at last... Uh, we have we are here, and I'm quite cu- I'm really quite curious, excited, a bit apprehensive as well about introducing <laughs> Alex to um, to uh, the world, uh, because I and I have to perhaps go on record here and say that I'm I'm a bit of a skeptic about oh, what do we and how on earth do you categorise this world self development. Is that the best umbrella term for it? Yeah, I think it is. Self-improvement, self-development, anything with self that's capitalised usually falls under the uh, the umbrella of the world I'm involved in, I guess. Okay, good. Yeah, well, that, that's... that's, And I think <laughs> we will come on to a section later on in the interview where um, I'd quite like to put the self-development industry a little bit under the microscope. We talked about this when we met, and you're up for, up for that. So you can satisfy my inner, or appease my inner sceptic about the whole thing. But for now, and to sort of to start with, and to get kind of the ball rolling, I, I moderate a, a group, a dastardly den of, den of iniquity, some dudes, who uh, are into um, game pickup. I don't know quite how you describe that particular category, women in dating, seduction. Do you have a, a term for that? Well, I suppose my term for it is just men who are interested in dating skills or social skills. But yeah, they tend to tends to be specifically for dating women, doesn't it? And and, and that sort of area. So I'd just say the dating industry, I guess. Well, that's quite a nice uh, um, sort of open goal you've given me in a way, because oh, romance has arrived. We've got we're now candlelit. <laughs> What could be better? So, uh, because there's there's part of I think part of the and popcorn. There's the, there's part of the world. The show is about to begin. The show. I don't know. Is this a trailer or a teaser or is this a B movie? I haven't, I, this is still the introduction. <laughs> and th- there is a um, you could put that world into two different camps: guys who want to get into relationships, and guys who. Uh, want to get laid mm. alright now I know you've come from that industry you first started work I think with Kezia Noble didn't you as a coach so I'm going to give you the microphone now Alex and perhaps you could just sort of start with that the audience in mind telling us a little bit about your story okay so first of all thank you very much for having me on um, when we met a few months ago I, I think we were both your, your scepticism I share a lot of um, and uh, we were having some very interesting conversations about the self-development world and about in a game, quote unquote. But yes, my history. So I, um, I, I was a client of a company called P-Way Training, which used to be the largest uh, company teaching, quote unquote, game skills. Can I just clarify, P-U-A Training? P-U-A Training, yes. Um, run by a guy called uh, Richard Larrowina, also Adam Lyons, who... Um, they've sort they've sort of old hat in the industry now. I guess they're, they're very old, but that'll date me. So that was in around 2009, 2010. I was a client of theirs, and then they sort of got me in as a as one of their success story students as a coach, and 
and I, I I was a coach for them for years and years and years. So um, not Kezia Noble. She actually left the company just just as I was joining. Um, so that's how I got into this very strange world. And I think you're right in terms of the types of guys who who are in the dating industry. There are there are men who sort of go in there wanting a relationship, um, and then there are men who go in there wanting to get laid. Uh, and then I'd, I'd even say there's sort of a third type um, who are men which are perhaps a little bit more insidious uh, with their desire and usually want to learn these skills as a form of control um, and as a for and to satisfy a particular uh, thirst for a power or a particularly or propagate a toxic relationship dynamic shall I say now I was an interesting case or I, th- I, I think I did what most people do especially when they're quite young because I got in quite young in that I want, went in wanting a relationship uh, and then I moved into the, the let's let's get laid category, shall we say? And um, I inhabited that for a few years until you know I met my. I started getting a bit sick of it. Um, and around the same time, I, I began getting very, very disillusioned with with what was happening in the self improvement, self development industry as a whole, which obviously includes the dating industry and pickup and that sort of world. And then I. I really put it on the back burner. I stopped doing it. I stopped having anything to do with with game coaching, dating coaching, whatever you want to call it. I retrained as a therapist because honestly, that was the biggest thing which helped me. But also, that's where I felt I that's where I felt I could be best, and I, I could do a job I was proud of. Right. What was your uh, career situation, your job situation at that time? So at that time, I was working in sales for a national English newspaper group, uh, who I shan't mention. Um, not one of the, not, not a nice one, let's put it that way. I sort of, you know, had some lower end, one, you know, a, a, a lads, sort of lads rag title that you'd see in builders, but also a, a title which would probably be read by primarily pensioners. Um, so, I, and I was working in sales for this advertising group. And I, so I worked in sales and in different sales roles for different companies, mainly in the media and advertising sector for years and years and years, doing the dating coaching, perhaps part-time on the side, and then eventually, not at all, I retrained as a therapist. And then I, uh, a few years ago, decided to take the plunge completely from all sales work and just uh, work as a the therapist uh, and social anxiety coach and stress coach, which is what I do now. So you're actually running, a, making a living running your own business in this area? Yeah. Oh, yes, so I make my living running my own business in, yeah, the self-improvement industry, definitely. I primarily work with people who have social anxiety, because I do have a lot of experience in that area, but also people who suffer from being overly stressed, who are perhaps feeling more depressed, uh, and who need to build more emotional resilience um, and develop that, learn those skills, develop those techniques so they can handle it when things become difficult for them. I mean, that's interesting. I develop, uh, you know, I'd like some more emotional resilience, you know, um, and I'd like to know how to deal with you know, obstacles better. What about, um, do, you ha- do you help guys overcome their inner obstacles I'm reading from my own quote here that that I'm very pleased with but let me finish it do you help guys overcome their inner obstacles so that they can go on to fuck younger and hotter girls or is that perhaps a bad uh, publicity decision for you to actually declare your you know your your your, I don't know your specialism in that area that's a very interesting question People have asked me about that. Um, I have had men come to me, and they usually say something like this: "Yeah, I've uh, I've seen you on. Ja- I've been featured on James Tusk's channel, um, his YouTube channel, which is very good. And um, so, you know, they they've seen me on there, and they think, hey, you know, I'm going to go to that Alex guy, because I think, especially in the game industry, people come across the term limiting belief quite a lot. And so, I'll get men of a certain age, and they'll email me, and they'll go, hey, you know, I want to date, I want to date some younger girls, or I want to date." hotter girls but I've got this limiting belief that I can't do it can you help me especially because they see the type of therapy I do which is a, which is, which is a very quick fix and it, it seems like it could definitely help there um, and you've I got, you, sorry to interrupt but you've got great credentials mm. for occupying that role were, were 
society to al- allow you to occupy. I don't know what your, your you know your views are about that, but. If, if you're referring to the fact that, you know, I used to work as a dating coach for a company like PUA Training. I'd say more than that. The way you present is like a guy who's been successful in this area. And then you've kind of, so you've delved in the dark side and now you're in the, you know, you've seen the light. Sh- shall I answer the, the initial question of, okay. So, in answer to your question, I could. I could, which is an odd thing to say, but I wouldn't. And the reason I'd say that is because, so these guys, they say, yeah, I've got this limiting belief. Um, I want to I wanna sleep with hotter women. I want to sleep with younger women. But I've got this limiting belief that a guy my age can't. Or a guy who looks like me can't. Okay. Here's a more interesting question. Let's say I waved my magic wand. And you were to suddenly have no limiting beliefs. And, and, and in addition, I'll give you the magical ability to sleep with whatever young hot attractive woman you want to sleep with i'm going to give you that ability now why is that so important well and then this is an interesting answer you get well i'll be happy okay why why would it make you feel better and that's a very hard question for people to answer sometimes because yeah you know we're thinking especially as guys of course we want to sleep with a more attractive woman or you know there's a there's an old guy and perhaps he's feeling a certain way and actually the reason he wants the reason he wants this isn't because he wants to sleep with a younger and more attractive woman. He wants to feel a certain way. And it's, he's, he doesn't want to feel a particular type of orgasm. An orgasm is an orgasm is an orgasm is an orgasm, shall we say. So that's not, it's not like that changes, really. What is it he's looking for? And it's because if he did, then maybe that means he's not a boring old sod. Maybe it means he's actually an attractive man. Maybe it means that he's worthwhile maybe it means his wife is wrong to leave him and he's not a loser or whatever it is and and i am very much painting a profile of a type of old older gentleman who might come to me and ask me that sort of question so yeah i could say right well yeah let, let's look at this but a more interesting question is well why do you want to and if you did what would it mean about you because that identifies the real limiting belief that identifies the real problem and maybe, and if it goes, gets down to the point where it's, okay, well, if I, if I did, then it would mean that I'm actually attractive after all, or I've still got it, or something like that. And that's important, because then that means I'm being, I'm a good version of being a man, or I'm good enough. Then you can actually get them to ask a different question, which is a better question, which is, okay, well, how would you know when you are actually good enough because you and I can sit here and we'd understand that this this gentleman who wants to sleep with the more younger or the more attractive woman that's not going to satisfy him and that's not going to give them what they want not really so what you can actually do is go well what's what what is it you're actually looking for here and then you can work to create that with somebody but I also have on many occasions just flat out told somebody no go away Really? So you have had a number of dudes approach you. In, in, I can, I'm going to just bring in a scene from a quite a cliche, quite a cliched scene in a cliched movie at this point, which um, is called Hitch, to Will Smith comedy mo- vehicle. And there's a scene in it where, where Will Smith plays part of a date doctor, date coach. Um, and there's a scene in it which is kind of rather ancillary but perhaps also rather telling in which he goes to meet a potential prospective client do you know the have you seen the film I've seen the film love the film know the scene you're referring to as well ah so he goes in to meet the the dickhead for want of a better expression who wants help in order to get in get out get laid get over it kind of thing um, and I, I, I watched Hitch back in the day and I laughed and loved it. But also, per- speaking personally, back in the day, I was a bit of a sentimental old... Well, I wasn't old. I was a bit sentimental, sentimentalised about the, the Hollywood dream of girlfriends and dating and, what, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but looking back, looking back on it, I, like, in a devil's advocate way, asked the question... He's a very one, two-dimensional character, that character in that scene. Mm. Almost deliberately so. Mm. But when you... You know, he's, he's an unpleasant character, the way he, he, he conducts himself. But on the other hand, um, you're, the hero in that film, Will Smith, is a guy who does exactly the same thing. 
historically, by all accounts. It's just the movie has to paint him as no longer a pickup artist, but now a date doctor who helps other guys get lovely girlfriends into their lives. So, um, I guess there's um, a, a, a question in my mind about whether or not um, there's a sort of like a little bit of a double standard in the self-help industry about turning away, and I hope you don't mind if I'm frank and direct about, about this, Alex, that, that the self-help industry, in order to appeal to the mass of the population where the money lies, okay, um, are going to portray dating success, but not actually tell men the real truth, which is that you are sort of like an evolutionary, biologically produced reproductive animal who um, has got his head full of fluffy Hollywood, Hollywood ideas and sentimentalised, feminised ideas. And actually, he, you need to learn, my friend, to go out and get in touch with the animal in you and you need to express it in the bedroom or, um, when you're dating. So let me just make sure I've got this right because obviously it was a, yeah. it was a, it's, a it's a very good question and I want to make sure I've got it clear so you're asking and I, I'm assuming what you're alluding to is the fact that okay so A I've said I'll turn some people down and is there a hypocrisy in that when the self development industry is trying to appeal to the masses and so what it's doing is it's, it's selling it's shaming it's shaming men's natural instincts to shall we say um Oh, uh, you play about a bit, or, or the desire to to be with many women, and telling them that they should just want to be with the one. Is that the rough question? Yeah, is that, it, it, that's right. It's, uh, there's there's some shaming, and there's, there's, a, there's also, on the, on the other hand, mm. offering the promise mm. of a normal, lovely, mm. dating Hollywood scenario. I mean, the character that Will Smith coaches in the movie, you know, he's never going to end up with a girl like that. But there's also the promise that. I'm going to water down pick up advice basically mm. in the self help industry mm. saying I can get you an attractive girlfriend mm. but then not actually telling the guy that the real story is that he needs to get in touch with an animal beast in him mm. which is very socially unacceptable and wouldn't sell. Um, no I think you're on the money with that and there is this hypocrisy but this is hypocrisy in the in the national and international conversation about masculinity shall we say. Uh, and this could get me on my hobby horse a little bit. So I'm, I'm going to actually just go back and explain the one point in terms of the people who I say no to, because um, I think that was what started all this off. Um, you may remember that I said, if you're looking at sort of men's involvement in the dating community, there are three types. There's the people who get into it because they want to get in a relationship. There are the people who get into it because they're, shall we say, looking to get laid more. And then there are, I described this third section who are, shall we say, particularly toxic. Um, and who are looking to get into it, not for any, not because of any satisfaction or improvement of themselves and ability to get with a woman, they're doing it because they want to learn how to better dominate control and generally express a more s insidious side of their personality. And those are, those are the people I usually say no to because, of course, they're not doing it for any reason other than, shall we say, nefarious ones. That's uh, really interesting. You've actually met these guys who come in, to your, in through your front door and actually almost like the cliche character in Hitch mm. asked you to help them get laid. Yeah, essentially this was very much more when I was still a coach and so, oh, still still a pickup coach. Um, because of also the type of coach I was and, and as you say, the maybe the way I look and the way I present myself and, and that, would pr that would probably factor into it a little bit as well. You know, they think, hey, here's a guy who you know, you might have a modicum of success, like somebody would with James Tusk, for instance. You know, good-looking guy, very well-dressed, presents himself very well. So, yeah, that was it was very much more then, but I still get it now. Um, I still get it from time to time now, and but it's very easy to see that, especially when you've been around for a while, and you... And when I, whenever I'm... Because I interview everyone I'm, I'm going to work with. Um, I speak to them for at least half an hour, usually 45 minutes to an hour. And in that period of time, there's a lot of question asking and, and you get a very good flavor with some people. And by the end of it, you do, you know, sometimes you do just say, look, this isn't right. Um, sometimes it's very clear that they have some sort of mental disorder and you have to say, and, and you sort of have to say no because it would be ir ir irresponsible to work with them. Uh, and this is an area where the self-development 
industry drastically fails people really fails people it is it fails to spot when somebody needs um, medical intervention um, or, or, or more serious therapeutic intervention um, but that's a, that's a point for another side in terms of the in terms of the point of okay is this ultimate an industry promising a lovely Hollywood relationship and, and neglecting man's need to be well, or just lying about the reality of the situation yeah or just lying I think this then opens up a very interesting conversation about masculinity and what it is to be a man in modern day. Now, if you sort of go back through the ages, shall we say, the relationship of a man with a woman, or a man being with a woman and a woman being with a man, or people being with anyone, let's include all genders here, or however you define gender, um, but men and women being together for love is incredibly recent as a development. Um, it is not something which human beings have done for a lot. It, it's, it's something we're still very new at. Uh, it used to be that we paired up because it was advantageous towards our survival, whether that was monetary or whether that was any other sort of thing going on, and love really didn't come into it at all. So this is being sold now, and it is a very American sort of idea that's now been pushed forwards. But of course, what you've also got to remember is that, well, a man would have been faithful and tied to one woman for her protection. That was sort of his sacrifice. You know, she would sacrifice herself as, you know, stay at home and childbearing and all that sort of thing. And the, and the man would therefore sacrifice his instinct of mating around, shall we say. And of course, because, you know, that wouldn't do, you know, there, there had to be a societal pressure on that because it seemed to be wrong to be sleeping around and, and not being faithful. So that's something which has been ingrained in us for socially for a long time because it's, you know, social changes happen much faster and, and, and ideal, ideas become ingrained much quicker than it takes for biology to say catch up with that. So that has however led to the fact that we are now in an age where it seems more than ever the the male drive or masculinity is being repressed further and further and further and further and in fact is being told it's wrong whereas before it used to be a bit of a laugh that you know men would still yeah you know, they might they you know they 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 might still be attracted to their only attracted to boobs and bums or whatever it was and all these things and that was that was sort of taken as a bit of oh well that's just Benny men Hill sort of thing for for, for the non UK members of the audience yeah, exactly classic hmm. smutty but light hearted British comedy yeah or Sid James in um in, in Carry On films shall, shall we say you know and that sort of seedy old man or that sort of seedy but you know quite light hearted but that was uh, that was also an acceptance of, shall we say, the darker and more animalistic part of, of the male personality. Um, whereas now, it, most parts of the male personality is rejected as something negative. So not only is there the drive to sleep with lots of different women, which it, or people, which is it, which is a biological drive, but it is one which tends to be mastered and, and by and large men tend to be happy when they are with one person or, or the idea of happiness, because happiness is very fluid. You know, people get happy with whatever situation they're in um, by and large. So that's not enough anymore. There then has to be the sacrifice of other parts of masculinity, um, pride, ego, levels of aggression towards a certain thing. And then of course men are being guilted for having privilege now, which is a, which is a new thing, but of course, when a man is having, when they are being blamed for everything and when they're having everything taken, when you can't get strong male characters in movies or TV shows because that's promoting a patriarchy and suppressing it and preventing the march of equality, well, is it any, it's no wonder that men are becoming more worried and more neutered and more upset and we see higher depression rates and we're seeing all these other problems because now all of a sudden, if you, if you were to listen to the media and believe everything they say, a man is guilty by, fa by the fact of being alive, essentially. Um, also, the, the things which men used to do, which was actually a good social thing, like being chivalrous, and wanting to take on protective roles, and wanting to, because men need to feel needed, and they need to, fi they need to feel like they're being powerful, and they need to feel like they're being useful in, in 
benign and benevolent ways not in negative and oppressive ways but they need to feel protective in a benevolent ways and they are looking after the things that matter to them but now of course they're being told they shouldn't do that and they should repress those urges because those are um those are part of the patriarchy and those are insulting and, and those are all these things and yes you know we, we want to move more to equality but it, it's no wonder to me that we are now seeing in the self-development industry the same repression and the and the hypocrisy is very clear because you've also got to bear in mind is the self-development industry is very much aimed at women and at promoting inner power which is a very feminine concept because you know we are now in an age where women have felt very disempowered and now they want to empower themselves um so of course the language is very feminine as well and that's why when you look at things that are targeted just for men it can come across a bit seedy and creepy because it's it's speaking to what Carl Jung would call the shadow the dark the the part of masculinity or the part of the man that doesn't that people feel shouldn't be acknowledged or should be ignored yeah and is a taboo and I think I mean to be honest with you the group that I moderate I'm not I'm a you know deep down in my boots I'm a nice guy you know Mr. Nice Guy but um, I have to learn learn stuff uh, but a lot of the guys on this group I mean they're pretty experienced dudes they seem to have their shit together to a point much as anyone can and they'll you know they'll be posting stuff on the group about uh, you know skills yeah I mean they're pretty yeah and well sharing skills about how to do it they're like they're, they're, they're like they've like accepted that they are ostracized there's this ostracization that you've described is that even a word yeah. so that yeah and and so therefore they've kind of at least I think these guys have owned and 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 have sort of at least planted a flag in the ground and say okay well I am this masculine uh, individual and I'm gonna go and pursue my reproductive strategy and you know what they should be allowed to do that as long as they're not my my thing is they should be allowed to do that and they should not be shamed for it either which is what would happen and it's not fair because pretty much now pretty much anybody is allowed to express whatever sexual freedom they want but not a man who's what who wants to pursue multiple women now here's the thing they shouldn't be pursuing it under any under any false pretenses you know i'm not saying that they should be lying to all they, they shouldn't be lying to any women that they're pursuing as long as they're being open and honest and they're saying you know what, i've got to be on it i don't do monogamy that's not my thing um then they should be able and and they're honest with that intention of theirs and that might and that mindset of theirs and that gives the other the other partner the other participant a chance to say no a, a real way to say no then they should be allowed to do whatever they want you know they they should they should be able to live that lifestyle without shame Oh, that's interesting. And you would coach them for a price with any inner obstacles that they might be experiencing. Because the guys I'm talking about, and just a big caveat here, so I'll give you the mic in a minute, just a big caveat here. In fact, grab the mic. This is a grab the mic type podcast situation. Um, if the beginner's listening to this, I, I actually think you don't want to start, and you perhaps haven't got a girlfriend or you can't, you've never got been laid, you don't want to start navel-gazing too much into inner game and self-development they call it inner game in the you know, and it's the self-development industry you probably want to be getting out there going out to the streets and approaching girls and opening up conversations and getting grabbing your balls and doing it and then once you've got a little bit of you've taken action as a man you've got a little bit of kind of progress there and momentum there then you this is and this is i try and make this podcast quite real about me as well mm. just to draw the macro out the micro if you like mm. And uh, this has been my experience, is that I've been through that process. I've kind of got, I don't really, I've kind of got pretty good at it. I mean, um, almost sort of being able to do it quite naturally sometimes, just during the course of a working day, and see an attractive girl. Um, whether I want to, I'm not, I'm not one of the guys who just wants to go out and get laid, though. But the point is that, that, you get. I've then got to an intermediate stage now, where I'm a bit like you were talking, alluding to earlier in your own development, wondering about. Well, hang on. Am I going to pursue my reproductive strategy now at 51? Um, <laughs> make up for lost time. Uh, I really want a partner. I'd love a, a decent girl. I'm not going to settle any longer mm. just for someone who just comes along. 
So, uh, and then, and there uh, is that I come across inner, ob I think, inner obstacles, which is why I was inspired to ask you on to this podcast. So I'll answer, um, I'll give two, two quick answers to that. So the first one you say for the people who are very new and beginning and just get out there, you know, that's pretty good advice. Um, I will add a caveat to that. Some people really want to, but they can't. They are the definition of social anxiety. And I don't know how many of these people we've come across, but I do, obviously, I, I do come across them a lot. And lots of people email me just saying, how do I just make myself let my feet move? Um, I, and I was very much like that. And that's why, I, so, I, so I do do therapy work with people who want to get out there, but physically can't. They physically can't because the anxiety is too much. So obviously that's where therapy work comes in. However, you're right. So if people have been out there a little bit longer and want to start delving into the inner game, do I pursue this reproductive strategy? What, you know, what do I want? And that's a hard question to answer. And that's often what I'm getting people to confront is going, well, what do you want? If you, so I want to do this. Okay, well, if you did X, what would that mean about you? Why would it be so important? And you need to really understand, okay, well, let's say you get this girlfriend of yours. You want a partner. You're ready to settle down. Well, you ask yourself why is it because that's what you feel you should be doing or is it because you feel it will give you a certain something and you may feel it's because it gives you okay a common answer to that oh we can, i mean we can do this live if you want i don't mind mm -hmm. delving into the little bit of um you know free therapy yeah. I, I i think it's that's what for me makes it real and preparatory to interviewing you i i did you know list some things down and um i've been on a uh, been doing a project for my youtube channel mm. called 52 first dates in a year where well, i went on i didn't end up going on 52 i went on 36 mm. first dates although it turned into more like 70 80 or 90 because there were second and third and fourth dates and so on and it was quite an interesting project i learned I, I learned the dating skills that I hadn't had when I was just learning approaching skills uh, kind of thing. Um, I had some success in the bedroom, but not a great deal, but just a little bit of success in the bedroom. Far more than I dreamed of before I got into this stuff four years ago, I guess. Um, but the mind, you're always dissatisfied, aren't you? But the objective of the, the, uh, the, the project was to, well, find a partner. If I didn't find a partner, at least become good at dating and enjoy and become better in this area of my life skills social skills as well as you know specifically dating skills and I found that I, uh, I again and again and again I've fallen at the final post so attractive girls in bedrooms and so on and so forth and there's a, a battle that goes on in me one is this is wrong to be just fucking lots and lots of girls yeah um, and it's not my background, which is sort of semi-religious and spiritual and a little bit Eastern religion and sort of stuff like that, and I shouldn't be just doing this. Mm. There's, there's another, is it a devil or an angel? I don't know, but it's something on the other shoulder. Bit of both, Could be both? Yeah. Probably is both, yeah. And uh, that one is like, Alex, you are kind of quitting on, or you've not learnt the skills of the final stage in the seduction process and you need to go there mate because you need to go through it this rite of passage mm. you not anybody else everyone else has got like like you were saying earlier they're coming through your front door um door of your surgery and you make a decision on how to deal with that person don't you so everything is is, is. so i just to bring the person into the podcast, which is, which is both uncomfortable but I think important, that is my current sort of because I'd always seen this pick up stuff as a rite of passage that I'd never really learned, and society then sent me completely in the wrong direction, and then I discovered this quite late at the age of 46. What I'll say to that is society hasn't sent you in the wrong direction, society has sent you in the direction which people have been going in for many, 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 many years. And it's not a right or wrong direction, it is a direction. So, the first question, or I'd, I'd, say, I'd say, I'd probably say the first question is, well, why is this a problem? Why does this matter? Um, 
and I know you're eating some popcorn right now, so I'll, I'll give an example answer, and then maybe you can provide me with your own, if you, if you feel comfortable. If not, I'm happy to go do this off example answers. So I'd have a guy and say, you know, I'm try- I've, learned, I've been learning these skills, I'm getting pretty good, but, you know, we're in the bedroom, and I can't make myself do it. Or I can't make myself take it further. I feel like I should, but I can't make myself take it further. So the first question I'd be interested in asking is, okay, well, why do you feel you have to? That's the first question. And they might say, because that's what I should be doing. And I don't know if that would be your answer. That's a fair question. I think the first thing that popped into my head was uh, because I've started something and I want to finish it. I'm like a man. If I'm on a golf course, I'm not going to just leave 16th hole. (laughs) I want to... And I want to get the, a birdie. So let's say you get the birdie. Two under par, whatever it is. Um, you get the birdie. Well, why is that so important? What would it mean about you if you did? Well, um, uh, definitely, I can't, can't lie. There'll be some validation about it. The, the, the mates that are now the mates in the, who that get up to mischief like, like I do would be high-fiving so why is that important because it makes me feel I've succeeded a bit like after you score a goal in football you run around like an idiot and pull your shirt over your head and not do high fives isn't it the same thing okay so then let me ask you is that a good type of success to be chasing is the success you're trying to is it wise that you're chasing a success which is contingent upon somebody else. Um, well, that, when you put it like the question like that, I would I I I would say no. That that kind of success that's contingent that sort of con- that sort of contingent success. I'm gonna, I'm gonna rudely interrupt you and ask a follow-up point. But let's say you are getting it and you are getting this contingent success. Well, what would that mean about you? Well, I guess the answer is I I have been getting it. I mean, not like. I mean, a regular relationship with a hot girl who, you know, we make sex in every part of the the house. But, but, yeah. Um, but let's say I was getting that. Is that partly your question? If you are getting it in that, because here's the thing: you're you're defining scenario. success. Yeah, you're you're defining this scenario. So you'll get you you know you're you're regularly getting the birdie and you're getting the validation from your peer group which which comes which comes about and you mentioned so if you were getting all that what would that mean about you well as i said that would a bit like the high-fiving after the scoring a goal in football that would make me feel yeah a man who's achieved it's a cheat that's that, that's right actually it's achievement i've been fly fishing today and it was we spent we, we hooked a couple of fish early on we lost them once well, the line snapped we don't me and my mate don't fly fish very much and then we spent the next four hours absolute nothing burning in the hot sun getting annoyed angry bitter like this fishing is stupid it's a waste of time but we were still doing it we wanted to catch the fish and then right at the end of the afternoon when it was getting dark by kind of more by hook and crook than by conventional fly fishing methods we actually got a fish and hooked it and we were so fucking delighted he was as delighted for for me I caught that one as caught it as I was and there was something kind of very primal and look here's the thing all of that's fine Um, I do just want to draw perhaps the listeners attention your attention to a couple but, of things can i sorry um alex but that's one thing but then there's also like a repeat notch count thing which i find really difficult to to deal with the idea that a guy would roam the world getting notches on his bedpost and then moving on and on and on that doesn't seem to me a very satisfying ambition so i'm going to do my best to try and actually draw a parallel between what you're talking about and the notch on the bedpost guy and and a few just a few things or features which already stuck out to me so the first is 
you know, it's completely natural that, of course, you know, you sleep with a pretty girl, you get to speak about it to your friends and they'll congratulate you, and that's validation, right? And, and we can't run away from the fact that other people's validation makes us feel good. However, like I said, is it wise for us to want or measure our successes by others' validation because then we will always, always forever be unsatisfied and forever have an esteem or self-esteem and view of ourselves which is completely fragile so the question i would then ask well what would you want what does being you you mentioned it's like being the ultimate man well what does that look like and that's a good question to ask because then you can think okay well actually it means this or it means that it means maybe being the ultimate man is sleeping around with lots of women but why is that important why is that it and keep and you keep on going down and maybe it's because if he sleeps with a lot of women that means he's a, that means he's an attractive person and that's important because attractive people are liked more and attractive people are successful okay well how would you know when you're successful not just about women but in general because usually what we're looking for here is we want something in particular that's very broad and then we we identify avenues to get it but actually there'll be other times in your life where you felt successful you felt attractive you felt ex accepted or intelligent or funny or loved or whatever it is you know this could be anything for any different listeners and usually they're not in that realm where you're where you're chasing the other thing i'll say is then the parallel between the notch on the bedpost guy and and perhaps your approach is his so he's exactly the same because for him and i've met enough of these people they only feel worthwhile if a woman is sleeping with them. That's the only time they feel that they're worthwhile or accepted. And, you know, therapeutically, you can do some very interesting work in going back and finding out why that's the case and how they learn to be that way and, and helping that. But if you're someone who tends to that way, you're thinking and feeling that the main time you feel validated or worthwhile or important or, pow or powerful or whatever it is, is when another woman has slept with you or given you her phone number, well, you've got to think about maybe why that is, what it means if she does that, and then how else might you be that way and make plans to deal with it. I'll give you an example from my life, uh, which, is, which is slightly different because I'm going to talk about my mother, um, but hopefully you'll see where the parallel is. Um, if you watched the talk I gave recently, and you'll probably know from that that my mother had Alzheimer's disease and, and she died, popped her clogs last year. Um, but when I really did not handle her getting ill very well, and I used to go and see her in her care home and she'd be a vegetable, and I really struggled with that. So much so I'd go home and drink half a bottle of whiskey minimum um, every time. And usually I'd, I'd be drinking, I, I was drinking a, a few bottles of whiskey a week at one point, um, quite sometimes you know a bottle a day well, I, I did a bottle a day for a while and that was bad um but the reason it got to me so much is because i was missing one thing and i was she was the only where she was the only person who made me feel safe and secure and that i was enough and it was a very particular action she did which i'm not going to mention uh, she, she hugged me in a very particular way and i was grieving the loss of that so much like in the way that a man who sleeps with lots of women because that's the only place he feels validated i was only feeling safe when I knew my mother was there to hug me in that way. That was the only time. And I was, I was forcibly deprived of that. So I had to then ask myself, well, how else might I feel safe and secure? And then I could go and create that. And this is the same thing for the guy who's only feeling validated or successful or worthwhile or confident when perhaps another woman is validating him by giving him her number. You can create it in a different way. So he's replacing the love he's lost from his mother with the attention and the success he's getting with other women in his life later on? Um, no, that's not what I was trying to say. I was saying I lost some... I, I had a particular thing in my life which fulfilled a particular need. For me, it was my mother made me feel safe. There's another... I'm drawing a parallel between that and the guy who sleeps with lots of women is notching a bedpost kind of guy because that's how he feels like he's enough. So you see what I mean? There's an external source which proves something about that person. My mother hugs me, that proves I'm safe. I sleep with lots of women, that proves I'm worthwhile. Do you see, do you see that relationship? Yeah, I can see you're just, yeah. All I was gonna say to follow that up is, you can change that. And the best thing you can do is change it to something which is non-contingent on another person, because then it's not in flux anymore. And once you realize, well, actually, I'm in control of my safety or I'm in control of how worthwhile I am, 
that gives you a lot of power and that stops you from getting to these choking points, shall we say. That, what you've just said there, it's like non-contingent, a, a journey towards, a man's journey towards self-reliance, like Emerson, you know, is, uh, that is a true statement. Hmm. A man learns not to be, con not to have his, his happiness contingent upon that, yeah. the actions of another. Hmm. Um, that I can, and I'll just, I'm just pausing for a moment to let that drop, drop in, that, that penny drop, because that's quite an important realisation. What that then makes me think is, because you've got the example of what's well, quite a natural masculine primal urge to hunt, to give the fishing example, but then you've got, he's a member of a fishing club, he's been a member for 15 years, and if, he, if, if they were to find out that he'd spent a whole day on the lake and hadn't cut, cut, caught a single trout, his sense of his world might crumble, and that is where the validation comes in. So it's almost as if, you, as a man, you sh could and should uh, um, experience and go on the adventure and uh, get in touch with your primal urges, but not, but only because that, for that reason only, that mm. connection with that process, mm. not because other people are going to hand you a trophy after you've done it. I think the way I'd put it is the ideal archer. Well, the ideal fisherman wouldn't worry if he caught a fish. He'd just want to make sure that every time he cast his line and chose his bait, he chose, the be he chose his bait as well as he could and he cast the line as well as he could. Because that's everything that's in his sphere of control. Whether the fish bite or not, is that's irrelevant. He can't control that. He just wants to focus on what he can control the best. And that is how you sit there for achieve the self-reliance that's non-contingent and, and um, yes look at the end of the day I'm describing an ideal um, we are humans we're not ideal so yeah the, he, of course he doesn't go he doesn't catch anything he's going to go back and be ribbed and he's going to feel he's going to feel sh chagrin about that right he's going to feel annoyed and he's going to feel a little bit annoyed at himself this is all that's normal but the thing is you want to do you want to forgive yourself for that for a start you want to forgive yourself a little bit of that chagrin and you and also, you you just want to remind yourself over and over again that actually a lot of this stuff is out of your control. Whether a woman sleeps with you or not, completely out of your control. That's her decision, not yours. You can do what you can do, but if it happens or not, that's, ir that's, that's irrelevant. And here's the thing, when you start expecting it to happen, or you believe you deserve it to happen because you put in so much effort and so much work and you spent years studying this and you tried so hard and you bought her many drinks and all these things, I deserve this. Well... No. No, you don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. Nobody deserves it. Deserve doesn't exist, at least in my world. But you don't deserve it. Nobody deserves it. And because when you believe you deserve it, that's when you start getting angry and you start having a negative and a toxic relationship with the thing. So earlier you were talking about you went fly fishing and the line snapped and you got you spent the rest of the day feeling angry. Well, the thing is when the light, you thought you had it, you're bringing it in and then the line snaps now you're robbed of something you deserved the catch and you were robbed and deprived of it and that's what makes you feel angry because you felt you deserved it and it's being denied to you and that helps propagate anger and discontent yeah no. uh well said perhaps we can start to segue now towards your own suggestions for getting one's sort of because i'm not asking you necessarily how to Although clearly you know how to how to seduce a woman, the A to the Z of it, but perhaps the other stuff around that, and I did like um, what you were saying in the emotional resilience vlog, which as I say I'll link at the video, which I'll, I'll link below. Um, yeah, the tips like Tell us a little bit about the really practical tips for guys in that sort of, sort of situation. Yeah. Okay, so the first thing I'd do, um, if you are sort of in, actually th these are applicable for any whatever stage you're at shall we say which is good um you for me it's really important to know what the problem is i think that's the number one thing because at whatever stage you are whatever quote unquote sticking point you have you need to know what the problem is so there are three things that i think are really useful for helping decipher this 
The first is create a worry box or a stress box or whatever you want to call it. But essentially what you do is you literally create a physical box, um, an old tissue box, and you, you, ca you either carry it around with you or you keep it at home or maybe you take it with you to work and put it on your desk. And any time during the day something happens that you're not happy about, that's caused you a bit of, yeah, that wasn't that great. Or, okay, so for example, yeah, I was speaking to this girl and I just felt a bit weird here and it didn't go quite well and, and that's not okay. You write, you write it down. Or you're angry about a date having gone badly. I Yes, exactly. So I, I, there was a client I was working with. Um, for I, I worked with him for a few weeks and he came to see me because he, um, he was quite successful, but he got really, really angry and upset when uh, girls didn't text him back. That was his main reason for coming to speak to me. And, he, and also when um, they didn't sleep with him. So we did a lot of work on why that was so important and this and that and the other. And he, we did a lot of anger issues, but this was very good for him. So it was every time that sort of happened, write it, you write it down. You write down the time, the situation, and you write down... Yeah, yeah, you write down the time and the situation. And you just put it in the box. Because what that does is it helps stop you from thinking on it very much what's called negative rumination because rumination is when you think on something negative rumination is when you think on it but every time you cycle through the thought in your head it just gets that little bit worse it almost adds an emotional charge to the rumination doesn't it a negative charge it increases the the charge uh, or it increases the emotion and so we'll talk about that because the next thing you so you put it in the box and you just leave it and you leave it there and then what you do is pick a time every evening and you open up the box or you tip it out and you just go through everything you've written down and put in that box and you really think about it and a good way to do it is to think about okay well in this situation what was I thinking or saying to myself what were the images I might have had so let's say you know um, you've had a date it's gone badly you're getting angry and you write down it's the third time it's happened you're starting to feel the world is against you you're bitter and angry about ever having got into this yeah. arena Exactly. So you might write down, okay, uh, date's gone wrong, she hasn't come back with me, angry, right? You get home, you take it out, and you go, okay, well, let's look at this. I remember this happening, because it happened today. So what was I thinking to myself at the time? Well, this is the third time this has happened. Why did I ever get into this? Maybe there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with her. She was a prude. Um, I'm not good at this. This is awful. Emo then you write down the emotions you're having. Anger, frustration, maybe a bit of fear that it's never going to click for you you write you write and then write down the behaviors you took as well and so okay well what did you do with yourself maybe you rushed off in a bit of a huff you held you crossed your arms and were feeling quite tense um you know maybe you just decided to go straight home and uh, you were listening to angry music or whatever it was so you write down the things you did as well because all those things your thoughts feelings and behaviors are completely interlinked and if you want to get good at changing one of them you, you sort of end up changing them all so what you do is you go through you go through your little worry box and you just make each situation that clear what you were thinking what you were feeling and what you did and then you can really start to tease some of those apart. So you can look at the thoughts and you can think, well, okay, maybe that, maybe I shouldn't be thinking that way. Maybe there's a better way I can think about this. You can provide some alternatives to those thoughts. You can see what common behaviors you take so you can change those behaviors. Because when you change the behavior, the thought process and the emotion tends to follow. Well, and I've got some, I actually took down some questions that you asked in your own talk. Is there an error in my thinking here? Is that like a classic question? Yes. What would I say to someone else with this problem? I quite like that one. Step aside for a moment. I think you've got to set aside time in the day. This isn't easy, guys. This is like going down the gym. Well, it's not as hard as that. But it is setting time, a little bit of time aside, you know, 15 minutes, maybe yeah. 30 minutes max, like a diary or something. Yeah. Um, and then thirdly, how are you interpreting the situation? Is that an important question? touches on the story theme that yeah. we were that, that you talk about a lot in yeah, your emotional resilience blog yourself, which I think yeah. is really interesting because you're not then just dealing with what was coming up necessarily you're for, the, with for that you're dealing with a lot going yeah. back yeah. Yeah. and so yeah exactly I'm, I'm glad you've got those to hand actually um, but yeah you, you ask yourself those questions you know, am I am I making any mistakes in the way I'm thinking because let's just say you know, you might have thought, well, it's never going to happen for me. Well, 
do you think you might be making a mistake in your thinking there? Because what are you doing? You're predicting the future. It's a very all or nothing statement, isn't it? So maybe you can just be aware that you think that you've thought that before and you can stop. And when you think of it next time, you can stop yourself from doing it. So yeah, all of those questions, fantastic things to do once you've identified all these different components. And then the final tip is um, just if you're really chewing over something, or something's bothering you, write it out, get a journal, and just five or ten minutes, anything that goes through your mind just goes out on paper. And you write it down, don't try and direct it, and just sort of, you'll be very interested with what comes up, and you'll be interested in the way your internal conversation or monologue changes. But then again, you can go through that and you can analyze all that. And it's, a very, in it's very interesting to see how your thought processes change over time. Um, I think that's probably it in terms of like some real nice practical things you can do. The other thing I'd say, which um, you won't have you won't have seen on that presentation, but it's always good to do is you know if you're finding yourself at any point anxious about the next step, whether that's going up and speaking to somebody or, or asking for the number or going for a kiss or whatever it is, and you're anxious about the next step, well, just logically project yourself forward in time because what we usually do is we imagine up to the pain point, the point where it's most embarrassing or painful for us, and we, then we tend to stop and go back and cycle over. Well, what would happen next? And that's a really good question to ask. Well, what would happen next? And usually things are fine. And when you do that, you can then usually get get over doing anything in, yeah. in that sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, good. Well, I think we should probably wrap up. We've been an hour now talking. Thanks for tuning in, dudes. Uh, I hope that's been of, of, of interest, stimulating and of value. Uh, I will just mention... The um, uh, I think it's definitely worthwhile having a look. Would you say that uh, emo emotional resilience presentation that you did? Um, yeah. where, where where should people start if they want to find out more about you? So if you want to find out more about me, uh, my website is practicalanxietysolutions.com. On there, you can find uh, the video um, Alex was talking about, where I spoke about emotional resilience. It's not the best quality; it was just recorded off uh, of my of my phone, actually, um, at the front of the room. Uh, but the people seem to enjoy it, and, and you can find that on my speaking page. Um, I have a Facebook page, which is Practical Anxiety Solutions, and I do tend to post in there, and you can hear me talk in little advice videos and tidbits. But also, please do feel free to email me. Um, I'm, I get lots of questions. I love answering people's questions. Sometimes I do say, hey, let's book a chat in. But, um, you know, if you do have any questions and you want to maybe hear more from me directly, send me an email, which is alex at practicalanxietysolutions.com. Um, my website is going to be updated with, some, with another talk I've given recently. So that's the best way to do it. Yeah, no, I quite like the simplicity of your website and the fact in your about me section you said, I don't really want to say a load of bunch of nonsense about me here's, here's the video <laughs> um, yeah and I personally I, I, I did sit down and had, had and I did actually do a couple of the tasks you recommended in your presentation I think the takeaway is, is the historical thing if you like it's a little and often uh, self reflection building up self-reliance and resilience not necessarily being contingent on success enjoying the process the fishing the hunt Absolutely. so you're designed for it like a leopard is designed or a cheetah is designed to run so um but don't make your happiness content or your contentment contingent upon it as long as you're any final words i mean really on that on that final note i think you've summed up very well learn to just be as yeah self-reliant take responsibility for yourself that's the main thing take responsibility for yourself you you decide the way you feel you decide the way you feel you decide the way you act those are the only two things you can control so you might as well get good at doing them um enjoy the process learn to enjoy the process as long as you're not mucking about with other people then you're fine i think if you make it essentially make it all about you try and do the best you can and have the courage to look inwards and ask yourself some of those difficult questions because you'll know the answer yes but you do need a little bit of a process and I'm a, and I you need to buy yourself a book and a pen not don't use your phone or your computer to do this and find some time on a Sunday morning I actually keep a clarity diary that I fill in I call it a clarity diary and I fill it in on a, on a Sunday 
and when you'll get fucked off about something or d- just distressed or sad or even perhaps delated sit down and reflect on 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 it and i do recommend you look at the emotional resilience tips towards us towards the latter part of of alex's talk okay well we better wind up so it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from it's goodbye from me the other alex on this podcast inundated with alex's good night guys